have surrendered to all my friends. They are all friends. Tell them we gonna be live soon. Here's some of the thoughts around uh, the recent signing of the basic exchange and cooperation agreement at the 2 plus 2 dialogue uh, that took place in Delhi on Tuesday. It's really an exciting time for these uh, two nations to come together. Um, so we look forward to having the conversation. Of course, this event, this webinar is the first of many in the series that's being put together um, by IAPC, the Indo-American Press Club, which of course is a nonprofit formed in New York, uh, my hometown, back in 2013. And it's just committed to bringing together journalists of Indian origin, living in the United States, Canada, um, and putting together wonderful programs like this, getting dialogue started. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the chairman, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Joseph the Chalil to introduce our panelists. Thank you. Good morning, good day, and good afternoon, and good evening to all viewers uh, who are dialing, dialing in from, from India. Thank you, Ashmita, for, for the kind words. And uh, this is an exciting time for Indo-American Trust Club. We are kicking off our uh, first um, series of first webinar, um, and the first one on the impact of India-US defense collaboration agreements today. We are really honored to have an esteemed speakers list. Um, I, I hereby welcome um, Lieutenant General PJS uh, Anu, um, former 14 Corps Commander of the Indian Army in Ladakh, and the former Deputy Chief of Integrated Defense Staff. We are lucky to have Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha with us. Um, he has received several awards, including Paramishit Seva Medal, Adi Vishit Seva Medal, and is a former Western Naval Command Chief of the Indian Navy. We have our own Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor, a luminary diplomat and a former Indian ambassador to Chile and Cambodia. Um, he's currently a visiting scholar in Washington DC and a recipient of last week's IAPC Excellence Award in, in literature when we had the international media conference. Um, we are lucky to have Ambassador Deepak Bora with us. He's a former secretary at the Ministry of External Affairs and a former ambassador of India to Poland. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rick Rosso, Richard Rosso, Senior Advisor and Badwani Chair in the India-US Policy Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here. Um, we, we have Professor Madhav Nalapat, who is the Director, the Department of Geopolitics at Manipal University and the Vice Chairperson at Manipal Advanced Research Group. Welcome, Professor Nalapat. And finally, we have Mr. Sri Iyer, um, who is an inventor, an out-of-box out thinker. Uh, Sri Iyer has over 37 patents in the areas of art, hardware, software, encryption, and systems. And he's uh, an author of several books, including several best Amazon bestsellers. So uh, to this esteemed uh, group of individuals, welcome and thank you. And again, um, Indo-American Press Club is honored to have you. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, I'm one of the largest um, Indian uh, such organization for Indian Americans in this country, including Canadians, Americans. Um, so we are honored to have this and we will be doing multiple such events going forward. Uh, please visit us online at indoamericanpressclub.com and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook uh, and like our program going forward. This will be live, live cast um, in several um, international channels and will be, will be placed in different media organizations afterwards. So um, back to you Ashmita uh, for the program. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chalo. Um, once again, a really esteemed group of folks joining us this, uh, this morning um, to get this conversation going. I think we have a lot of key uh, sectors covered here with this group. So when we talk about the U.S.-India relationship, uh, this uh, relationship 
stretches back decades. It persists beyond any specific current administration. Of course, certain administrations um, have enhanced it and, and grown and, and further developed the relationship. Um, so when we talk about the growth in this relationship and the administration's effect um, with the U.S. presidential election looming just a few days away, I think everyone's holding their breath for this one. Um, if there is a change in the administration, uh, how can we see this relationship between these two countries being impacted? And I'm going to start with Ambassador Kapoor for this. Ambassador Kapoor, if you could kick off the conversation here. Well, uh, with the if there is a change in the administration in the U.S. with the elections, uh, you know, due on the third of November, uh, there would be some changes between India-U.S. Uh, interactions and relations. And a lot of other areas, there would be continuity. The changes where I see uh, prominently between the two countries would be a, you know, somewhat of a slowing down in the Quad uh, relationship, which is the India, US, Japan, and Australia, to some extent, the strategic discussions. What the current administration of Trump did uh, in his four years was to ratchet up our security and strategic dialogue to a very high level. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, for example, made some very uh, important announcements on behalf of the government and the administration in the last few months in particular. They have changed the dynamics of India-US relations in a very significant manner. Having said that, sitting here in Washington, D.C., what I see is that a large part of the strategic community in the US, a very significant component of the political community in the US, including the senators and the congressmen at the House of Representatives on the Capitol Hill, the academic community in the US, the business community in the US. Most of these communities are quite unanimous and decided and there is a consensus that uh, Future relations between India and US are going to be very important and could become the defining uh, relation and defining partnership of the 21st century. The media and some uh, elements of uh, some other segments which are having vested interest with China or other uh, countries, uh, they are trying to sort of uh, put forward an alternate uh, hypothesis, alternate point of view. But overall, I feel that uh, it will not be easy for Biden or Kamala Harris to sort of, you know, go back on the steps which have been taken already because of the consensus in all these communities. Mm -hmm. Normally, the president of the U.S. enjoys a lot of leeway, as we have seen with Trump also on the actions he took with climate change, on the action he took with the NAFTA, on the action he took with NATO. So there is a lot of flexibility and uh, authority with the White House and the president to walk back also. But when there is so much of consensus and so much of general agreement for anybody to then make changes is not easy. Thank you. Gee, uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, kind of uh, breakdown, Ambassador Kapoor. Um, you know, when we talk a little bit about the meetings themselves, right? So this two plus two format, um, uh, like you were uh, discussing with us earlier, is not exactly uh, the go-to format here. And I want to kind of, uh, you know, uh, focus on that, the significance of these two plus two meetings that take place, um, especially the timing a week before the, the big election, right? So for for this, um, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Rosso. Um, uh, Richard, if you can kind of tell us, first of all, for those folks who don't, you know, have an expertise in foreign relations, bureaucracy, these kind of uh, um, uh, matters, the significance of the two plus two meetings, and then please a comment on the timing. Well, uh, yeah, so two plus two format, um, it's not completely novel to the U.S.-India relationship. The United States, India, and others have got these kind of relationships with others, but basically it brings together a uh, country's foreign policy leader, in the U.S. case, the Secretary of State, and the military leader, uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, for consultations with their, uh, with their counterparts. Now, you've seen different permutations in terms of how the United States uh, engages India for our principal ministerial level dialogue, you know, starting back with the, uh, the strategic dialogue that was led by the State Department and the Ministry of External Affairs, then you saw a strategic and commercial dialogue launched during the Obama administration that brought the Secretary of State and Secretary of Commerce with their Indian counterparts. And then for Trump to, to announce the, uh, the two plus two. 
Um, I do think that uh, a dialogue that brings together commercial elements, you know, is pretty important, frankly, because it's the weakest part of our relationship. You know, since Prime Minister Modi came to office six years ago, you've seen India take a much more protectionist bent on trade, driven in large part by the fact that India has a massive trade deficit of the world. The United States also in recent years has also become a lot more protectionist. So, you know, you would like to see, I think, some evolution that accommodates um, these real pain points that we've seen in how our governments are engaging on commercial issues. But the two plus two, I mean, you can't deny that it has been very successful. Um, you've seen a signing of significant agreements. You see the United States really opening up our eyes to some of the threats that India faces in the Indian Ocean region, which, I mean, for experts outside the India lane had really not been what we considered, you know, primary when we think about the, the contest that we face uh, with China across the Asia region. So the two plus two has been significant. You've seen a lot of door openings but it also leaves open the real weak area of our cooperation, which is on the economic side. In terms of timing, um, you know, it's extremely significant because I don't like to overplay that this was a last minute ditch effort to try to win a few more votes from the Indian American community. I honestly do think that um, you know, there was one uh, important agreement that was ready to be captured. Uh, it was time to have the meeting. If it didn't happen now, and especially if uh, President Trump loses the election, it could be you know, five or six months before you have the US administration put back together and ready to engage again. So you know, it's either now or it looks like we're kind of putting the, uh, the dialogue with India on hold. And we did have at least one significant agreement that soak up. So, so the timing was important just to show that the relationship with India is important. I think some of the political overtones here in the United States are overstated sometimes. Wonderful. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Russell, for that. I, I want to go with the same question to Professor Nalabut, but, but uh, I want to make a comment here on, on a little bit what you said, uh, uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, you know, uh, earlier when we were talking, a, a point was made uh, by uh, uh, General Panu. Um, how can you have two unequal nations forge an equal partnership, right? And I think that's kind of uh, what we're trying to see play out here. Uh, Professor Nalabut, I'd love to see, uh, I'd love to hear your take on the same question um, from the India perspective the significance of this two plus two meeting. And like Richard said, even if it is a last ditch effort to get a few more votes at the worst, um, do you see the greater uh, potential of this uh, related to the timing at all? Uh, what do you think, Professor? Well, uh, I'd like to say that I don't think votes were behind it. Uh, I'd like to say that this, the, the reason why I think this meeting took place, uh, despite being so close to the US election, is essentially because this is the final bookend. You know, you had a beginning uh, of the bookend in 2001 when there was a military intelligence agreement. Again, that was a BJP government, Mr. Vajpayee's government. Uh, subsequently, you had, uh, then there are three foundation agreements. The first foundation agreement was signed when President Obama was in, was in the White House. And I'd like to say that the, for the first five or six years, I mean, about five years, of Obama's, uh, you know, eight years, uh, there was a, the shadow of the Clintons. And pardon me, but if I'm trotting on some toes here, but Bill Clinton was never really friendly to India in terms of practice. You separate the words and the practice, he was never really friendly to India. But once, uh, you know, that shadow left, uh, Obama went very far towards being friendly to India and an important agreement was signed during his time. And the remaining two agreements have been signed during the time of uh, Donald Trump, and it's not it's not coincidental uh, incidental that all four agreements have been signed during the period of the BJP government, or the three agreements have been signed uh, under Prime Minister Modi. Prime Minister Modi, you know, as you know, there were problems with his visa, but he put all that aside as soon as he became Prime Minister and made the development of relations with the U.S. a priority. Now, why is that? It is because it is very clear, and I would like to say that to the Chinese, it's been very clear that they are in some kind of a, of a conflict with the US. On the US side, I think it's been less clear because the Chinese definition of conflict is dominating uh, mind space, dominating decisions, whereas the American uh, you know, the definition, it's basically a lot of guns and artillery and bombs. And if you don't have that, well, you're not at war. I'm sorry, but the Chinese, are a little more subtle about these matters. So the reality is that um, the American side, I think, has definitely realized that there is a conflict between China and the United States. And may I point out, for example, in the case of COVID, the pandemic, 
Now, I know I'm not one of those conspiracy theorists who say that China exported the pandemic, although about 6,000 flights leaving from Wuhan and other parts of Hubei province, the rest of the world, certainly spread it. I'm sure the Chinese were completely unaware that flights carrying passengers who carry COVID would spread the disease. And remember, WHO assured everybody that those flights were safe. So maybe the Chinese believe the WHO. I mean, let me be charitable to them and say that. But the reality of the situation is today, the United States fully understands that there is a conflict going on with China and COVID has resulted in a huge expansion in the power of the bureaucracy over the citizen. I mean, you know, I'm looking at television and I'm told in the UK, the UK government is going to decide how close you are going to sit with your wife or your, or your children in your own house. Well, I, I mean, after the Magna Carta, I don't think that's ever happened, but to the Chinese, that will be music. It's the Chinese system, you know, had transplanted uh, because of the steps being taken in the COVID virus. And I would only like to say that, uh, you know, again, if, if you don't mind a, a minute more, in the case of HIV, you had an effort to create a, to create a form of virus. The virus kept on mutating. There was no vaccine. But what happened was therapeutics were, and ultimately it was George W. Bush, a Republican president who decided that enough is enough. We are going to turn to India and 90% of the therapeutics for ensuring that AIDS is no longer a fatal disease comes from India. My own guess, and I'd like to say in my department, we do a lot of futures planning. My own guess is that, okay, we may have a vaccine, but we are definitely going to get therapeutics and if that happens, if you need therapeutics that are affordable to the world and the United States included, you'll have to get them from India. That can be a great partnership. And that's why I was encouraged when Secretary Pompeo talked about the health partnership also. I want to say that today in Cold War 2.0, India is as important, more important than China was in Cold War 1.0, which is why I'm, I'm not worried about whether Joe Biden, I mean, I'm not worried about what Hunter Biden did or did not do. I'm not worried about whether Joe Biden was soft or squidgy on China or not. The United States now knows it is at war with China. And one thing that the Japanese found out after Pearl Harbor, well, when the United States decides on something, well, then you better keep out of the way. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, you know, uh, Secretary of Defense Mark Ex uh, Esper, who was involved in these conversations, these two plus two meetings, said that the defense ties between our two nations remain a key pillar of our overall bilateral relationship. So I want to go and uh, talk to the brass that's joining us on this call, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Pannu and Vice Admiral Shaker Sinha. Uh, let's get your opinion from a, a defense standpoint. Uh, what is the significance uh, of, of this U.S.-India collaboration agreements and any comments on the timing, of course, uh, would be much appreciated. We'll start with you, General Panu. Um, uh, you know, today, uh, as we sit, uh, all of us, I think it's a great testimony that the fact is that we are sitting together, we are sitting with a lot of concern, we are sitting with a lot of hope, and we are sitting with a lot of potential of coming together of two opposite sides of the globe, which never sat together like this. Uh, year 2020 uh, was shaping up, but we never knew it was going to shape up like this. Uh, really speaking, the United States and India sit on two opposite sides and two different islands of the world. Um, we have some similarities and we also have certain dissimilarities and therefore that uh, is a challenge. Uh, India has over 7,000 uh, kilometers of coastline, and double of that is our frontier with two nations, uh, one on the west, that is Pakistan, and in the north, which is China. With both our neighbors, we have territorial disputes. And today, as we stand, both have become our adversaries and enemy to the west and adversary to the north, both collaborating and may come in for a military collusive action against India, not only to settle the territorial dispute, but also look at us in a manner that if any nation in this region uh, has a potential to rise, it is India. Uh, having said that, 
today the relationship is defined by five T's and I would talk it uh, in, in terms of trade, uh, territories, technology, uh, terror. And also when you talk about the uh, trillion dollar economies, uh, that is economy. So when we talk about these five T's put together, uh, you find that our neighbor to the West is a global supplier of terrorism. It has exported terrorism and nothing else. Uh, our Northern adversary has had issues, not only with India, but all over the globe with as far as trade and technology is concerned. Um, historically, uh, US and India have been on the opposite sides. If you really look at how the military uh, division is done by the United States in the past is that Pakistan is towards the CENTCOM and India has been part of the PACOM. It means they looked at Pakistan as a different block to solve different geostrategic interests and problems for the United Nations. But I would give marks to somebody who coined this uh, new terminology, which has a geostrategic significance, calling it Indo-Pacific. When you talk about Indo-Pacific, it is really turning the whole globe and considering India that we are also a global power, we dominate and we always looked at the Indian Ocean region as the area of interest. And uh, the Americans always looked at the Pacific and they looked at us from different windows where Pakistan is concerned and India is concerned. And India has been historically uh, in the Soviet bloc. Uh, the military equipment, uh, we have long-term uh, agreements with uh, Russia. Uh, a large number of uh, you know, platforms have been uh, Russian uh, in origin. But this year and few years, the way things have changed up, there has been a seismic change in the geopolitics of this region and of, of the whole globe. How do we decouple? Uh, the Americans have to decouple from Pakistan because they never saw Pakistan as a threat to India as far as terrorism is concerned. We saw China from our own window of a threat to us. But if Russia and China put together, bring trade and technology together, and if Pakistan and China put uh, trade and terrorism together, uh, you see the, how the whole globe has turned around. I think two democracies, which we always spoke about two democracies, but I think we had more divergences than a commonality of democracy. But now we have common interests, and I'm glad Americans have recognized the interest of Indian that we sit on the opposite side of the globe to democracies and also the diaspora, uh, which sits in America, I think brings in a, a lot of traction between the relationship between the two countries. You know, IAPC is, is, is uh, proof uh, that, you know, the Indian diaspora really pushes the American interest onto the Indian uh, mainland. So therefore, uh, I, would, I don't know whether I should thank China, but the fact is that today there is a common threat of China, not to the world, but literally speaking to India, because we have a direct territorial confrontation. We have over 100,000 troops sitting on higher Himalayan regions defending our territory. We are not belligerent, but uh, Chinese being, uh, you know, um, a threat to the world are really pushing uh, the envelope uh, territorially in, in, on our northern fronts and also as far as the South China Sea is concerned. Uh, in, in the ASEAN region. But the fact is that the Russians have been long-standing uh, allies of India. How do we decouple the Indo-Russian old, you know, uh, not alliances, but relations? And how do we make America decouple from Pakistan and make this entire region, Pakistan, China, India, see as one part of the problem and how do we come together? And I'm glad that these agreements that we are talking about have been signed. It means the militaries can come together. We can be interoperable. We have a larger understanding of a problem. And if militaries come together in exercises in a few days, I think the ships are taking place uh, in opposition into the Malabar where uh, you know, the Quad countries are forming up together for this exercise. After a very long, long attempt, uh, Admiral uh, Shekhar Sinha will be able to throw more light on it. Uh, I think with all the agreements in place, uh, interoperability and the intent, and also uh, in physical form, the militaries can come together. But will this make a cogent relationship? That is, that is what we need to see and we hope. That, absolutely, that, that, absolutely. Right.
Thank you, General Panu. And I think you raised a couple of really good points here, right? Uh, the, the focus on the uh, transition or the evolution of the Pakistan-US relationship as a result of these agreements uh, is definitely something to watch. But I think the bigger point here is uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend, and that seems to be playing out with the China situation, definitely. Uh, Vice Admiral uh, Sina, I'd love for you to comment on the same question and maybe shed a little bit more light about these uh, Malabar exercises. It's specifically in relation to this quad grouping that we're hearing about, you know, and, and if there's any potential for this quad um, in this Indo-Pacific region, uh, like General Panu is talking about, um, has the potential to become a, a NATO-like alliance uh, in that region, uh, Vice Admiral Sinha. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Joseph, for inviting me to this uh, program uh, and seeing so many uh, my very good friends and really uh, on the Indian strategic circle, they are very respected ones. Um, you know, there are one point which I completely agree with Secretary uh, Defense, uh, Mike Esper, uh, when he says that, you know, the, the main pillar of the uh, relationship between US and India uh, is actually the military relationship. Uh, it was in 1992-93 when I first participated in the Malabar exercise. It was just a bilateral naval exercise. Nothing more than that. It didn't have any MEA clearance. It didn't have any uh, anything to do between two countries. Uh, but you know, we have had a we have had a government which the ministry cleared for us to go ahead and do the exercise. Um, and 2007, the only time that we have had five countries participating. Um, and again, I, I was one of the officer in tactical command as a rear admiral, and I saw the changes and uh, the complexity of the exercises which has gone up. So as far as the signing of agreements are concerned, <clears throat> my view is that uh, um, it has all been necessitated because of the increasing complexity of exercises, the naval exercises between these two navies. Uh, otherwise, there would have been no need to sign a Comcasa. There would have been no need to sign Vika, really. Uh, it so happens that time-wise, it has fallen in track. Uh, because, you see, there are some agreements which can be signed, uh, you know, keeping it within the two navies and understanding. However, subsequently it requires a, a clearance from the, you know, if the political coverage has to be given to this entire thing. And therefore the political coverages have been more difficult to come. Uh, I would say that at least from Indian point of view, uh, the navies of the two countries or Navy of India has been way ahead of the, the Ministry of External Affairs uh, thinking. Uh, MEA has only now, just a couple of years back, they have opened the Indian Ocean, uh, you know, the, uh, department to handle this issue. Whereas the Navy has had its eyes on Indian Ocean right from the time we began our uh, service. Uh, and we knew that, you know, this is the area that we have to look at subsequently. So I think that, you know, it is a good timing and it has taken so much time for the two foreign officers to come to understanding, to give it the political umbrella, which it requires for these agreements to be signed because these are, there are legalities involved in this. And therefore this had to come. Uh, you know, it's not that Beka is going to make one huge difference to naval exercise. Answer is no. When we signed Comcasa, the interoperability was proven. And we were already, you know, transacting the intelligence at, in the maritime domain. Um, but now with the Beka being signed, uh, this is very timely, as General Panu said, that we have got very large uh, land borders under dispute and our troops, as we talk, are, you know, watched up at probably minus 30, minus 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, and they will be there throughout the winter uh, at some much sort of lower temperatures than what the Chinese are. And therefore, we need to, we needed to have this Bika, Bika agreement uh, where the geospatial data can be exchanged and the targeting can become that much more simpler, both by the drones and by our... I think we have very timely signing of these uh, agreements on the 2 plus 2 agreement. Gee, thank you so much, Vice Admiral uh, Sina. Uh, appreciate your uh, viewpoint on this. You know, I, I'd love to jump back to a little bit of the diplomacy aspect and uh, you, this uh, skirmish at the Ladakh border uh, with the Chinese military and their aggression, uh, key, you know, uh, coming up as such a hot topic, especially in India, but even across the Atlantic here in the United States. Ambassador Deepak Bora, I'd 
I'd love to hear from you. Uh, in, in your viewpoint, is there anything specific when it comes to these Becca agreements and what India hopes to uh, message to convey to China here? Thank you very much for this opportunity to learn from all the wonderful people on your panel. <clears throat> just a little correction. I'm not just ambassador to Poland, but Poland, Lithuania, Armenia, Georgia, Sudan, South Sudan kicked around much quicker than my colleagues and did six ambassadorships. Uh, basically, you've talked of two plus two, ma'am. It's actually 1.3 billion plus 330 million. That's the strength of the relationship. You know, it was in 1492 that this rotten navigator, a character called Christopher Columbus, came looking for us and found America. And then it's very interesting, General Panu talked about the five T's. General, there's a sixth T, which is chai, the tea that we drink. We recall the Boston Tea Party that brought India and America together. Also, at least India came from the American consciousness because the East India Company was trying to tax the American colonies. And then it was a major movement in America's independence struggle. Let me just put it to you like this, sir, that in 1947, when we became independent, America couldn't care less. We were not on their radar screen at all. They were too focused on rebuilding Europe after the Second World War, containing the Soviet Union. 67 onwards, the Middle East and then and Israel because of all the trouble that happened there. It was only after 9-11 that Islam came into the American focus on their radar screen and Asia became important and people talked about the pivot to Asia. Earlier, of course, <clears throat> as far as communism is concerned, the USA had outsourced its business to countries like Pakistan and Iran and so on, which said, okay, we are going to clobber the Soviets. It never did happen. Now we are in 2020, sir. The US remains the world's paramount military and economic power. We are third on both counts. Don't write off the Indian military. It's probably man to man. Let them fight without weapons. We'd probably clobber anybody on this planet. So where have we seen our defense relations over the last few years, in the last 15 years? There is a convergence, ma'am, of security perceptions and world visions in step with other areas of improved bilateral relations. What we are seeing, this two plus two, or the, the quad, or the quint, or the sext, or the sept, or whatever you call it, it's an informal partnership against an aggressive and abusive China. I'm not going to talk about the various foundational agreements that have been signed, Becca being the most uh, recent, but it suggests a bilateral level of comfort and trust. That is increasing. Ma'am, we got some weapons from the United States in 1962. But when we went to war with Pakistan in 65, they imposed sanctions. We couldn't get spares. We couldn't get ammunition. That was hardly calculated to increase the trust and confidence that we had. In the United States, it was bilateral. No complaints about that. It's happened what has happened. What we are seeing today, ma'am, United States has made a strategic bet. General Panu, Admiral uh, Sinha, the strategic bet is that India will decisively shape the military balance in Asia. And I am convinced sitting in, at this moment in the Midwest, that United States will win this bet. If I may recall the catch line of the Virginia Slims advertisements of the 60s and 70s, by the way, when I was posted in Washington, 82 to 85, it was still around. These specifically targeted American women, convincing them to smoke the Virginia Slims uh, thin cigarettes. And the catch line was, you've come a long way, baby. And this is what I'd like to say to both United States and India. From the time of our independence to date, we've both come a long way, baby. Thank you for that, Ambassador Vora. Uh, you know, when it comes to defense, I want to go back to uh, Mr. Rosso here. Uh, the fact that um, from the Indian perspective, uh, the way uh, Ambassador Vora so eloquently put, we've come a long way. Um, Mr. Rosso, from the American perspective, would you agree with that statement? Is there anything from talking about the partnership of the defense mechanisms, uh, apparatuses of these two countries, um, do you agree with what uh, Ambassador Vora just said? Yeah, I think just, uh, just five or six years ago, um, kind of one of my taglines when I was asked that question is, for the most part, uh, a focus on India kind of relies on whether you're lucky enough to have senior US administration officials that just happen to care. You don't become Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense or even their direct reports because you're good on India. You have to be good and knowledgeable about, you know, either the U.S. processes of procurement and development, uh, good on Russia, good on China. You know, whether or not somebody at those senior levels that can really move the needle on big issues is good on India was really, in some instances, just kind of a roll of the dice. And luckily, we've had some good rolls of the dice. Most significantly, I think, you know, the former U.S. Defense Secretary, Ash Carter, who at the day that we lost uh, the, the, the two U.S. platforms being brought to the finals 
of the media multi-role combat aircraft bid, you know, most of Washington was ready to give up on India for another generation. And Secretary Carter was really one of the only people of that level and stature that said, no, it's time to really figure out how we can make this relationship work rather than presuming that announcing a nuclear deal meant that the United States was going to be the defense partner of choice. You know, these things weren't as strongly linked in Delhi as I think Washington had thought they would be. And so, um, you know, you've had uh, some good rolls of the dice where luckily it happened. I think for the most part, with most of the senior people that you've seen in the Trump administration, you know, the, 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 the various defense secretaries we had, Mattis and Esper, um, the two secretaries of state, I don't think any of them came in with really much background and depth on India necessarily. But because of the gravity of the importance of the relationship, they've chosen when they have a few minutes in between, you know, the crises they're putting out around the world to really uh, let that ember grow and blow on it in just the right way, you know, initiate the right kind of agreements. As I mentioned before, you know, it, this has caused Uncle Sam to bend in uncomfortable ways. We, we don't typically bend, you know, we announce a direction and expect everybody to jump on. And it took us a long time to understand that this just was never going to work with India. And so like, for instance, the, the free and open Indo-Pacific, you know, I was, you know, very fortunate to host Secretary Tillerson for that uh, important announcement when they announced the strategy uh, at CSIS. And I say at the time, a lot of us were shocked, you know, for Secretary Tillerson to talk about the United States and India as the port and starboard lights of Asian security. Uh, you know, our partnerships with Japan, Australia, Korea, and others are far deeper than what we've done with India even today. You know, it's, it's still like the, 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 depth, the, the width of the, uh, the difference, you know, is tremendous. So for Tillerson to put that on paper and say, you know, this is, this is where we're at, actually, he didn't even kind of put it in the future text, was, was frankly shocking. But at the time, as I mentioned in my last comments, you know, this Indo-Pacific term, you know, the Indo was really about dragging India, hopefully, into the fights that we saw as most prominent in the Western Pacific. Um, and, and seeing the way that the Modi administration has managed to massage that and get the United States to be more cognizant of threats in the Indian Ocean. So, uh, so certainly the relationship today, you know, it's a little bit less reliance on having, you know, the lucky appointments of senior people that care about it, um, there's so much momentum there. The fact that we can sign agreements so much faster than we could before, you know, that really provides momentum that, that we just hadn't seen before. So uh, leagues away from, you know, 22 years ago when I first started working in this beat and there was very little to speak of, um, you know, the question is, what do the next phases look like? Is it the bilateral? Is it the quad as you brought up before? A lot of directions, I think, in the U.S. administration can take it, but, but enough momentum where I'm sure they're going to. Uh, absolutely. And when we talk about uh, India being a little uh, protectionist, this has been uh, definitely a, a classically Indian thing to be. So, uh, you know, when we talk about this quad grouping and Ambassador uh, Kapoor, I'd like to go uh, to you and then to the rest of the panel for this one. How likely is it that in this quad grouping where uh, the U.S., India, Australia, Japan are coming together, but really it's India, Australia, Japan that are the regional partners and the U.S. is, uh, so to speak, invited to the party. Um, Ambassador uh, Kapoor, how likely do you think that India will move away from its classically protectionist uh, stance and embrace this uh, new evolution of geopolitics taking place in that region? Well, having worked with the Indian uh, bureaucracy inside the Indian system for many decades, it is not an easy shift in the mindset of the, you know, Indian diplomacy or Indian bureaucracy. But I'm happy that the shift is taking place slowly. It is taking place. And, uh, you know, with the administration of Prime Minister Modi, uh, it is happening. Uh, earlier administrations, I'm not sure whether it would have happened in this way, in this manner. And I think it is essential that it happens and continues to happen and maybe a little faster than what is happening even now uh, because we have traditionally been a you know regional power or in the earlier times uh, very great global power if you see some studies which were done you know for the global economy in the last 2000 years for example in the first 1500 years uh, these studies which were done by the economists, by the International Monetary Fund, by Angus Madison consultants, uh, they have shown that uh, the contribution by the Indian economy to the global economy for the first thousand years in purchasing power parity terms was more than one third of the global economy. For the next 500 years, the Indian economy contributed more than 25% of the global economy 
uh, to the world economy. And then the decline started after the British colonial rule uh, came about in India. And it's only now that the Indian uh, economy and the Indian sort of uh, uh, presence on the global stage is increasing. So we have to understand that to be part of the narrative, we have to play a more active role. Uh, well, in the sense that when you talk about uh, US coming to join the party, I don't know whether that is correct because uh, it has the Pacific, it has the Atlantic. A lot of these countries are uh, on the Atlantic side or the Pacific side, like Korea and Japan and everybody. Uh, they are neighbors from that perspective. So it has a legitimate claim to be an equal partner. And the term itself, pivot to Asia policy, I'm glad to say on this forum that uh, this was also given an impetus during my interactions as uh, joint, uh, you know, uh, Director South in the ministry and as ambassador in Cambodia, where I interacted with the American ambassador, the Japanese ambassador, the British ambassador, and the Australian ambassador. And we did uh, get into very in-depth discussions on how India and US could work together along with these other countries to sort of uh, strategically uh, challenge what was emerging as a very big threat from China. So out of those discussions and other uh, sort of inspirations, I guess the pivot to Asia was born finally. And it is now taking a greater shape in what General Panu said earlier about the Indo-Pacific terminology. So it is a, a useful thing, but what I see as a future is that the Quad should not just be the Quad. It should expand itself to consider other countries like France, which has already made statements about uh, wanting to support uh, India's actions also in various dimensions, uh, Israel also, and uh, so many other European countries and other countries who would want to come in from the perspective of, uh, you know, strategic cooperation, security cooperation, and as an arc of democracy. Thank you. And thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you mentioned uh, the economy and the global economy and how uh, these countries have so much tied in together. And I want to go to Mr. Sri Iyer for this. Uh, Mr. Iyer, if you could comment a little bit uh, on, on how you think the economic ties uh, can impact the defense and the strategic partnerships that are on the line here, Mr. Iyer. Um, thank you. And um, one of the uh, important uh, facets of the Indo-United States uh, relationship has been the fact that ever since the Y2K problem uh, surfaced in the late 90s, India has been providing a lot of resources in terms of uh, trying to combat some of the day-to-day -day challenges in the technical sec technology sector for uh, America. And now what we are seeing is that Indian engineers are either, either working in the United States or back home, they have been contributing significantly to all the big companies in the United States. In fact, uh, anytime a, a startup is talked about in Silicon Valley, one of the first questions the venture capitalists ask is, what is your India strategy? And, and the, the reason that is asked is, what they want to know is, which aspects of your product idea development are you going to use India for, for resources. Now, in this, um, uh, the, in this uh, uh, relationship, <clears throat> the Indian government has done several uh, steps, taken several steps forward, like for example, bringing in bankruptcy code laws and, and a few other things. And there's a continuous process. India has to still uh, you know, make its uh, stock exchanges more vibrant, be, have, be able to provide uh, capital for the startup companies in India, which might be, uh, you know, looking to the st stock exchange for that. And, and these things are still work in progress. I'd like to see that go faster. But here's where the American companies can provide the leadership for India. The, the move away from China to other destinations for low-cost manufacturing has started in real earners, uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh. And, and I think India can play a very significant role in this. I'm, I'm already glad to see that Apple and some of the big companies have started manufacturing a fair amount of stuff in India. India has the talent, it can scale up. It has a few other deficiencies, but these things are being worked out. For example, recently, the Uttar Pradesh chief minister has announced that there is a three year holiday for all the labor laws. So it essentially makes it much easier for companies to set shop in 
um, in you know, Uttar Pradesh, there's an area called Noida, which is very close to the Delhi airport, which is in Uttar Pradesh, which has become a big hub of technological activity. So all these things are in progress. The, the most important thing that I'd like uh, the United States companies to take cognizance is that India has arrived. India has taken to internet like a fish takes to water, and they have been completely, um, you know, uh, absorbed in this. Just to give you an example, during this Corona phase, the number of online streaming companies in India is already six. I mean, you, you for the longest time in the United States, you had only uh, Amazon and Netflix, and then Hulu. And, and now, you know, India has already gone past that. So the point I'm trying to make here is India is a great market for American products. India is also a great resource for uh, American needs. And, and this uh, Becca agreement can only make this thing even better. And I'm hoping that as India gets becomes more significant a player in the quad that it will start also absorbing some of the other technological aspects of the United States Navy because I know the other three members they're very closely tied in in terms of military equipment with the American uh, technology India has had a you know a mishmash of various technologies Russian European Israeli and a little bit of American all these things have to now start coming together because if they are going to become as a single unit to counter some of the aggressive uh, uh, you know postures of uh, china they'll have to start working in tandem and singing the same music beating to the same dance thank you thank you mr ayer uh, you know you, you talked a little bit about um China and Russia and, and, and how some of the things that India can offer um, from an economic standpoint um, have to be better specifically than what China is offering right now. Um, coming back a little bit to the defense portion of this um, and, and, and the policy that's at play here, uh, Professor Nalapath, I'd love to hear from you. How is China and Russia, how do you foresee them reacting to this new relationship uh, that, that's taking place here? Well, I'd like to say that both of them were extremely unhappy about this Indo-Pacific construct. And uh, both of them are hoping that uh, a Biden administration will do away with the Indo-Pacific and go back to the old Atlantic, Pacific, etc. You see, let's not forget one thing. Uh, after the Second World War, the Atlanticist order was created because both sides of the Atlantic did form the center of gravity so far as global geopolitics is concerned. Today, economics, technology, and strategic interest has ensured that it's North America and Asia. That is the very key relationship. And you know, I, I've, 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 I've heard some countries being named as members of the Quad. I would like to see Vietnam. I'd like to see Indonesia, for example, as members of the Quad, because the Indo-Pacific today is not the Atlantic uh, era anymore. It's the Indo-Pacific era. And that is something which I think many uh, people in the United States have not yet recognized. Second point I'd like to make, look, when you know, the, how do the Chinese do, uh, I mean, the, be the success they are? Not because they produced every, every bit of their nuts and bolts in China, but they got it from all over the place, assembled it, added value to it. In my view, the Sino-Russian alliance is going to pose a formidable threat to the US defense industry. A formidable threat, in not just in terms of security, but in terms of defense sales. And for that, therefore, there has to be a reliance on platforms uh, in India. And if these two countries come together, if, for example, you have you know, aircraft manufacturing plant, let's say Nashik. Nashik was building uh, Russian jets for a long time. But now that is, uh, that is you know, a, a decision has been taken to discontinue that, not to go in for a new generation Indo-Russian fighter. Well, if the Americans come and, and then start working on, on building aircraft there, uh, exporting quite a lot of that aircraft because the prices are going to be much more reasonable, much more competitive with the Sino-Russian alliance, well then, that's going to result in the, an increase in security for the United States and India. It's going to result in more American jobs and Indian jobs, and less Chinese jobs and less Russian jobs. So I'd like to say the complementarity between these two countries is enormous. And I think the general will agree with me in this particular problem that we had with China, in which 
I think you know we we frankly a lot more Chinese soldiers were 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 sent to the other world than the than the martyrs who died on the Indian side. But in this, American equipment was very important. So you have a lot of people in the military who have been basically soaked in the past. In the past, the Americans were the bad guys. The Russians were the were were, were the good guys. But then you have the Apache helicopter. You have the C-130, uh, you know, lift uh, aircraft. You have uh, Chinook helicopters. You have uh, smart, uh, you know, uh, uh, systems. All kinds of systems that uh, that are now there. And now you have this immense fund of real-time information, which enables you to zero in on targets, even though there is there in the Himalayan mountains in between. So I can only say, from the American point of view and the Indian point of view. There is going to be a conflict with China, and China will hope it will be a limited conflict. But in that limited conflict, if China prevails, it's bad for American democracy. It's bad for Indian democracy. And if China does not prevail, I can tell you, it's horrible for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, General Panu, I'd uh, like to keep uh, continuing uh, the thought that uh, uh, Professor Nalapat just left at. Do you think that this could potentially be the start of a new Cold War between uh, China and uh, the partners in this alliance or the United States in, on an individual basis, uh, General Panu? Um, yes, Ashmita. Uh, people have been talking about a new Cold War between uh, US and China. Uh, from the Indian perspective, really speaking, India is nearly in a hot war situation with China. Uh, when you talk about a cold war, really cold war is, you know, to bring the balance of power, to, you know, bring in military equipment, and then, you know, to posture, and then you talk about things which are more deterrent in nature. Um, should India and China go to war, India would like to see, and India would like to hear and understand from United States what exactly United States will bring for India. Um, would there be a confrontation partner uh, to bring in forces, not on the Indian territory or Indian soil, but in support because after all, both are partnering on the ocean region, that is the Indian Ocean and the Pacific as we've been speaking about, or would they go for a binary stretch and uh, you know, partner with Japan into the South China Sea or go to the ASEAN region and, you know, cobble a better relations in terms of military alliance as was being spoken about. Literally, when you talk about only two countries, India, uh, sorry, uh, the US and the uh, Chinese Cold War, I think you have to understand what blocks will this kind of a Cold War throw up. Um, is it Sino, Russian, Pakistan, some ASEAN, some Eurasian uh, block, you know, uh, coming together, uh, and uh, rest of the world, as we're talking about Quad Plus Plus, uh, as was being spoken about, that we would bring in certain European nations into it and certain ASEAN nations into it. So you have to draw a line that uh, what would these blocks look like? Uh, in Cold War, uh, is nothing but you know you are dividing the world in in parts, and in this if you have to talk about dividing world in two parts, uh, two major powers, uh, Russia and China, who have the same ideology coming together, uh, and uh, Pakistan and North Korea are, are rogue elements who can be uh, used in any manner because both of them have nuclear weapons with them. Uh, a terrorist uh, with a bomb, uh, such as the uh, nuclear bomb, can bring in so much of confusion in the Cold War that you would not know who's actually balancing and who's uh, doing who's bidding. Uh, as a result, what I would say that India and United States have to very clearly understand that the confrontation which India today is facing from the Chinese on the borders, on active borders, how is this going to pan out should we go to war? Now, I have spoken about it only from a perspective of a conventional war. Today, from technology and all the elements of the agreements that we are talking about, you know, sharing of information and having the communication and interoperability, literally speaking, when two militaries or a couple of militaries put together and become interoperable and they exchange information, 
and then the high technology of missile warfare, space warfare, cyber warfare, uh, chemical and biological warfare has already been uh, unleashed and people are still trying to understand whether COVID is part of the biological warfare or not. But literally speaking, why is the year 2020 different? Uh, year 2020 is different because the start point was COVID and China has actually attacked the world. If still people want to go in for an alliance or a partnership of necessity with China, such as the blocks that I have spoken about, I think China may not really find trust, trustworthy friends because they will continue to attack because of the uh, corridors, you know, BRI and all that was cobbled up. I think there is a military uh, a strategy behind the BRI, uh, you know, and uh, uh, how, how, how they are actually laying the string of pearls uh, all, all around the world. But I think this is more complex. Uh, I would not really talk about the US-China Cold War. I think the dynamics are very, very different. And we have to uh, shape up in a manner so that China or their allies or prospective allies do not bring in a major concentration. And India is going to be as a, a front line. And we are very concerned about it. And we'd like to know exactly what America will bring for us. Gee, absolutely. Thank you, General Panu. Uh, while India and China may be engaged in a hot war, um, India and Russia, on the other hand, do have certain uh, ties that are currently in play. Uh, uh, Ambassador Vora, I'd love to hear from you. How do you feel that these uh, emerging agreements and alliances, and specifically the Becca agreements that were just signed, will impact the India-Russia relationship? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to come back. First of all, as General Pandu has said, in which we clearly believe in the event of a confrontation with China, we do not expect American soldiers to come in with guns blazing. Well, what we did want was access to certain technology, to certain weapon system, and to our information, which we are getting. What we have with the United States today, ma'am, it's very important to remember, is an alliance without a formal treaty. You can couch it in whatever language you want, but that is the reality. Frozen narratives, fossilized mindsets have gone out the window, and we have a brand new, shining brand new, just off the shelf kind of partnership with the United States, a partnership of people who are angry and aggrieved by what these fellows in Beijing are doing, the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people. So your question about what will happen to our relationship with Russia, we're adept. We have a lot of experience of managing uh, these kind of relationships on their own, keep each bilateral. Certainly, what we're doing with the United States will have an impact. The Russians might get upset, but so be it. May I just say one more thing, ma'am? All this talk about Russia-China nexus, ma'am, Russia is the successor to the USSR. They haven't forgotten that they were the, one of the two major hyperpowers in the world for a very long time. That it collapsed within 70 years is a different issue, but they have very strong recollections of that. They're not going to play second fiddle to China. This is where China is making a mistake, thinking that Russia, because of its present economic difficulties, is going to play second fiddle to China. It will not, not for very long. And therefore, I think we have played our cards brilliantly, thanks to brilliant diplomats like Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor, not like me, that we now are in a position where both sides are looking to us as a nation, the youngest country in the world, with a formidable army, with fighting experience, able to deliver what we want, which is a free world, ma'am. That is it, period. We don't want a world with Chinese characteristics. Happy birthday. The Chinese can keep it themselves. We want freedom. This is one value that the human mind accepts, adopts, has wanted across the years. And the Indian military is able to do it, ma'am. What you've seen in Galwan, we are used to fighting at that. I'm special advisor in Ladakh to the autonomous councils. I know our boys are the best in the world. We fought 1999, the resilience of the Indian army. The Americans sat up and said, hey guys, these fellows went up those heights and clobbered those guys sitting there. Yes, we did. And we'll clobber the Chinese if they try to come in. General Pandu, you may not agree. I believe we are the finest fighting force ever in the history of mankind. I rest my case. I agree. I, I, I always agreed on this, uh, President. <laughs> Thank you. From our days in Sudan together. Thank you, General Pan. <laughs>
Absolutely. Uh, so we've covered a little bit about the uh, India-China uh, relationship in India and Russia, um, but I want to pivot now to the United States and Pakistan. This was touched on uh, briefly earlier in the conversation. Uh, General Panu uh, mentioned this. You know, I, I, I'd love to hear uh, from Mr. Rosso. Mr. Rosso, how do you feel that the uh, United States-Pakistan relationship will transition as a result of these Becca agreements? Uh, knowing full well the sentiments regarding Pakistan uh, on the Indian side? Well, I think, you know, by and large, the United States um, now shares those sentiments. Pakistan has some direct utility. I mean, ultimately, um, as it exists today, the future of Afghanistan will lie to some extent, you know, through, uh, through Pakistan. So as the United States begins to consider our options, and of course, uh, for a while now, we thought that an absolute and utter uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan was quickly on the cards. Um, we don't know, you know, should President Trump lose, um, how Vice President Biden uh, might take that up as president. But ultimately, um, trying to win Pakistan's support for, for, for stability in Afghanistan after a U.S. withdrawal when that happens, that'll always bob up as one reason that Pakistan is going to remain fairly important. I think we can all debate uh, until we're blue in the face about whether Pakistan would ever uh, truly support that as, a, uh, as an initiative, at least uh, for a government that wasn't directly controlled by Pakistan itself. But, uh, but that, that, that one area of utility will mean that the United States will remain engaged. But in other facets, you know, this idea about decoupling how we treat India and Pakistan, it is now so far in the rearview mirror, it's simply not a question, except for when India or Pakistan raise it. Um, but for US uh, strategic analysts, you know, we do treat the two so very differently. And frankly, I, I think that recognition from Delhi has really been one of the factors that's allowed us to kind of unlock the ability to sign these agreements and move forward on our defense relationship. I think at the end of the day, you know, India's own uh, strategic analysts realize, you know, there is some utility in the Afghan question, but there's no love for Pakistan, you know, barring that from, from senior players um, in, in the United States administration and those, you know, that are just on the outside that help to guide the, uh, the security front. So, uh, so, so to me, you know, the divorce has been uh, fairly significant, but uh, still some utility that will linger for Pakistan uh, because of the Afghanistan question, but that's about it now. Thank you. And I'd uh, like to get an Indian perspective on the same uh, question. Uh, so we'll go to uh, Ambassador uh, Kapoor for this. Ambassador Kapoor, how do you feel that the uh, India U.S.-Pakistan relationship uh, will uh, evolve as a result of these agreements? Well, uh, as a result of these agreements or otherwise, what I would agree with what uh, Rika said earlier and uh, uh, there would be some relevance and some importance in the American mind for some time about Pakistan, though it will start uh, receding soon. Part of the reason has also been what we have seen in the Ministry of External Affairs. Here I just want to tell you a few stories about this aspect that the way the U.S. diplomats, particularly single lady diplomats, have been treated in Pakistan <laughs> in the past, uh, uh, you know, has been uh, like walking in the air these lady diplomats are treated like queens and they get the best men from pakistan and uh, so uh, they be get the best gifts before they go back and we have uh, known so many diplomats who have come back to the u.s state department and have written uh, notes which are uh, quite uh, you know absurd and in the extreme uh, favoring pakistan so that sort of uh, you know remnants of those uh, thoughts and actions will continue for some more time because to me pakistan is more a piece of uh, real estate play for china today than for us and a very costly piece of real estate in terms of the terrorism in terms of the future problems which it will create for uh, china in so many different ways and uh, uh, the you know discussions which I've had with many diplomats from uh, uh, U.S., from Canada, from European countries about their interactions with Pakistani diplomats or the Pakistani administration, uh, about how frustrated they have been in trying to get anything out of them which is uh, bene benevolent or beneficial for the world, uh, is not. Uh, it's like an endless piece of uh, litanies of complaint. But in spite of all that, they still manage to succeed to some extent in some ways. Uh, uh, you know, it's been exposed to a great extent now because a lot of the others have written a lot about it. Uh, but still, like Rick said, that you know, the assumptions in US 
that oh on afghanistan we will still need pakistan or on tackling terrorism we will still need pakistan that'll take uh, maybe a few more years for them to see the uh, realities in the light of day ji thank you ambassador uh, for that um of course these agreements by and large a signal a uh, a step in the right direction a positive undertaking um but just to kind of wrap up the conversation before we do closing remarks i'd uh, be really interested to hear a comment uh, from our our panelists on how this uh, collaboration between the united states and india particularly of the military apparatuses um you know is there any uh, instance where you foresee this being a sort of trojan horse um with india uh, uh, providing a space uh, for the uh, american military apparatus only to uh, like ambassador kapoor just said uh, be real estate in the play so i I'd, i'd love to hear from professor nalapat on this uh, to get this started well uh, i'd like to say that the answer is an unequivocal no the reality is that if you look at the long term the objectives of india and the united states are are almost the same and that's not an accident the india us relationship is not like the us china relationship the us china relationship was top down the the president of the united states and the chairman of the communist party got together and the top has uh, you know got together top businessmen got together top officials top think tankers got together and i think the chinese are extremely adept at making friends and they are particularly interested in making friends in washington but the indian relationship is because of the member uh, of of individuals like the members of the of the indo american press club and you know millions of of, of people who have migrated from india to the united states millions of people in india who are working in the knowledge industry in the united states hundreds of thousands of indian americans who are working in the same industry and you know as this as uh, shri ayer who is uh, w- 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 one of them would say you go to i mean you i, I went to san jose and quite frankly i thought you know i i, I was in tamil nadu or sometimes in andhra sometimes in gujarat i never got the sense that i was in any any place other than these three states and i was in san jose with my wife so i would only like to say that look no this is a healthy relationship and for the first time our short term you know the we have actually we have got the same objectives but we differ on methods we differ on tactics but now because of the threat that we are facing from china and from terror and these are the twin threats that india and the united states will need to fight together terror and china and it's not an accident the two countries that uh, the you know that the country that general pannu is is naming now frankly i would like to hand it to my american friends they are the most generous people in the world you know <laughs> you have a country where in kunduz for example all the pakistan military trainers of the extremists and al qaeda were were removed were courtesy george w bush president bush you have a country where osama bin laden was hiding in plain sight of the pakistan military and they knew nothing about it you have a country where the taliban i mean you know who gave the names of around 1600 so called warlords to the americans and the americans gave a rich amounts of money to these warlords and guess what uh, i mean they gave money to i'm told about 1100 of that 1100 approximately you know 1900 turn our sh- our short term interests and the long term interests of our two countries are aligned we are complementary to each other including in defense production including in security cooperation so let me tell you and i am as someone who has written a lot against america and american policy all my life i am very very sure this relationship will go forward i know the chinese are banking on sons and daughters of influential people i mean it's not that trump towers does not have uh, you know the chinese investors i'm sure there are a lot of you know excellent facilities in the trump properties that are owned by respectable and reputable chinese but i'd like to say despite all that i can tell you the chinese threat is now recognized in america as it is in india and the united states also recognizes on a completely if i may say so bipartisan basis that unless you have india on your side and we also you know we are prickly people we are we have a slight ego 
I mean that you know, her, and uh, even with our ego, we understand we need this partnership, and that's precisely why Becca has been signed, which is the final foundation agreement establishing this Indo-Pacific partnership. Gee, thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Iyer, your name was brought up, so I have to go to you for a comment on this. Uh, do you uh, agree with uh, P Professor Nalapat's sentiment that this alliance, this partnership can only mean good things, uh, Mr. Iyer? Yes, indeed. But uh, like they say, you know, it takes two hands to clap. There are some things that India needs to do that would help America go a long way. For example, in Afghanistan, India is more culturally aligned with Afghanistan. And when the United States came asking for help, India should have stepped up to the plate. I know I'm going to treat on a few toes here. Please uh, forgive me for doing so. India should have stepped up to the plate and they should have uh, offered to help out so that when this transition now U.S. had no option because India said no, the, mm -hmm. other than to go and sit on the same table with the Taliban. So this was unfortunate, especially because I'm told that Prime Minister Modi in his visit uh, in 2017 promised that India would put boots on the ground in Afghanistan only to welch on it when McMaster's came calling to India. These kinds of things will not help. I hope this is the first and the last time that something like this happens. In fact, if you look at uh, what has been happening in the last few days, uh, Iran's Chabahar port is definitely in play for India. And I hope that through Chabahar, India has a plan to reach Kabul by road through Iran. And I hope this thing bears fruit and that there is a road access to Kabul from Chabahar. And I hope India can make use of that. India can build it for them. India can maintain it for them because it's a neutral uh, country as far as both those countries are concerned. And, and let's hope that something like that happens because this is not just, you know, we get all the technology from uh, America and India suddenly becomes, you know, a, a superpower. It's, it's both sides. America needs help. Even now, it is never too late for India to get involved in Afghanistan. Let them make us strike a hard bargain. Uh, ask United States. We will need this, 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 all these drones, these aircraft, these things. And in exchange for that, we will put 20,000 boots on the ground in Afghanistan. Let them strike a hard bargain and let them move forward with that. That's the kind of pa uh, partnership that I'd like to see. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. I think Vice Admiral Sinha, you wanted to chime in on this uh, discussion, uh, Vice Admiral. Yeah, uh, you know, it is uh, often said on, uh, you know, these forums, uh, but, you know, the India has its sole national sort of compulsions and national view. Uh, after all, it's a democracy, just like it has become important for uh, America to walk out of Afghanistan. It is also important for Indian polity not to enter Afghanistan militarily. And as far as the road is concerned, I, have, I hope that Mr. Ayer knows that the road from Dilaram to right up to Herat uh, and further up to Kabul has already been built by India. It is in operation. And from there, it is coming right up to the place called Zaranj on the border. And uh, the other road construction and railway line construction is already beginning. Contract has been let out. So obviously, it is very much because of the India's push. And it is India which has requested the Americans that, you know, you have to have a as we understand your issue with Pakistan, that you have to have friends, India has also got enough people who understand, you know, that uh, what should America do? In fact, the Indians have gone to the Americans telling them that you have to have a view uh, which is more congenial to your strategic partners like India, and you keep putting sanctions on them for things like, you know, S-400 and Iran, Chabar port, and then you expect us to uh, uh, play in your team. Sorry, it will not do. And that is the reason why they respect each other's decision. They have hosted it correctly. And I think it is moving in the right direction because you know any uh, alterations right now, we'll have to wait till the presidential election. We'll see how it goes. But the basic, the foundational agreements having been signed, they are institutionalized. And therefore institutions can't be changed in a hurry. It might slow down the process of institutions becoming stronger but you cannot take it away from its what it is formed. And therefore there was a hurry because it's a political decision and those decisions cannot be changed in our way. Because the administration, the people, the bureaucracy is going to remain. It has taken so many years to come to this. I first, we did the first draft of Limoa, Beka and uh, Komkasa 
in the year of the Lord 2008. And we, we are now looking at 2020, it has been signed. So all these agreements had a very standard format of the American bilateral agreements. India said, sorry, we don't fit into the standard format. India is not some banana republic. We are you know, 1.3 billion people. And you will have to take our concerns on board. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, the Lemoa, the Comcasa, and Beka, I dare say, they have all taken the Indian concerns and they have been amended accordingly. That is why it has taken eight years. So I think that you know we understand each other. And I, you know, we can have views. I also have a view, you have everybody is entitled to a view. But whatever is happening, it is view of the people of that country. So I think we should not forget that in democracy, people are important, views can be hundreds. Absolutely. Ambassador Bora, I'd, uh, speaking of views, I'd love to hear your view on this. Do you feel that these agreements um, largely are spelling positive things for the future, or there's any uh, concerns that India or the Indian people should have in this regard? This idea of putting boots on the ground in Afghanistan, I think that belongs to a century and an era that has gone by in modern thinking. We've done it only thrice in recent memory in Bangladesh and Maldives and Sri Lanka. Of course, the first two were very successful. The third, the jury is still out on that one. But where this coming together of India and United States, we've called us natural allies, makes a lot of sense. That is going to be one of the defining partnerships of our century because we both stand for freedom. We both stand for the evolution of the human spirit. Let me put it across. We have an American colleague on the panel. Sir, if you were today to say that whoever wants to emigrate to the United States can, let me assure you, 7.8 billion people would be knocking on your doors to get in, which is the population of our planet. Let me also just say, ma'am, as far as China is concerned, never before in human history has one ping pong, whatever the fellow's name is, managed to alienate the rest of the world so quickly. He has destroyed himself, he has destroyed his party, he's probably going to destroy his country unless he takes the lesson of a man who 80 years ago promised his people that they would rule for a thousand years, the Third Reich, devastated his country, pulled out a weapon, put it to his forehead and pulled the trigger. I hope Mr. Ping Pong gets a lesson from that man because the India-America partnership is unstoppable. Uh, strong words, uh, Ambassador Vora. Uh, we look forward to seeing I'm known for that, ma'am. That's why I was never a successful ambassador. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would love to keep this conversation going, but unfortunately, um, I have to go around and do closing remarks at this stage. So I'm going to get started with Ambassador Kapoor. Um, your closing remarks on this discussion today, Ambassador. Well, I think that uh, the possibility of uh, the India-US relations becoming the defining partnership for the 21st century is very bright and uh, both the sides will have to do a lot of work for it. India also has to do a lot of work in setting its own domestic house in order economically and otherwise, uh, but the you know future is very bright. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Lieutenant General Panu, uh, closing remarks from your answer. Um. When we talk about the agreements, uh, agreements certainly are enablers. But when it, it comes to interest, I think the understanding of Indian interests by the Americans is extremely important. For the simple reason that, uh, uh, as in my question, which I had uh, sent earlier, that it is a partnership of not equal. Uh, you know, we are not superpower. We are not global power. We are aspiring regional power. But our interests have to be respected, our interests have to be looked after, and all those sanctions and threats of cuts are like, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, issues uh, have to be looked at in a very practical manner that India needs to have more confidence in how the Americans look at us. Uh, we would want, um, you know, US must hold same view as us on Tibet on Pakistan, on terrorism, on Indian Ocean region. Uh, India actually is a net importer of uh, military hardware. Uh, we would want transfer of technology. Now, uh, you know, with the agreements, it's going to be possible. We've also signed the ISA. Uh, but India should also become a global manufacturing hub. Uh, we must have higher GDP on which the percentage of the defense expenditure will also go up. India should not remain only a buyer-seller relation, you know, under these agreements that uh, we get bound uh, by only buying equipment and using that equipment 
to fight our wars, India needs to be uh, self-reliant and India needs to have confidence and we need to have higher GDP. And I think America can look at, look at India to be made into a global manufacturing hub as was or is China, you know, as, as of day. I think that shift uh, can offer America and India a great future. Absolutely. Uh, Vice Admiral Sinha, closing remarks from your answer. I think you're on mute, sir. Vice Admiral, you're on mute. We can't hear you. There yeah. we go. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the, uh, you know, the military partnership and uh, quad and two plus two is concerned, as I mentioned in the beginning, that it all began with a very nebulous uh, uh, region that uh, the reason that the two, two navies were pretty close to each other and they started off as a normal exercise. But uh, I'm personally very happy to see that it has built to this level. Uh, well, having been associated for a very, very long time, uh, right from the inception. Um, and also, uh, people tend to forget that the first big military sale uh, by the American uh, company was done in the form of Boeing PHI to the Indian Navy. Uh, when we had uh, sort of a government, which is not very uh, sort of, shall I say, uh, they, have, they had more communists in the, in the ministry than the, uh, you know, the liberals. Uh, and I had a very tough time to get this thing going in the... Uh, and I'm glad that it is already operational and it came while I was still in service as the company chief. So I think that for me, it's a great satisfaction personally. Uh, and I would go all out. We have been, uh, uh, Professor Nalapat and I have been discussing this number of times, formally, informally. Uh, but this is here to stay. Uh, it can slow down. It can become quick, but it's not going to go away. That's all I'll say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral. Uh, moving along, um, uh, Mr. Richard Rosso, your closing remarks, please. Yeah, just two things I want to underscore, not that they weren't brought up before, but uh, Quad and CATSA. So on the upside, you know, when we think about the Quad, we, I get asked questions a lot about whether this will be the new kind of Asian NATO. And it's, uh, it's uncomfortable, I think, to put new constructs in, in those kind of boxes. But there are, there are very defined things that the Quad can do, both uh, military and non-military. On the military side, of course, we've got the first uh, joint exercise among the four partners coming up in, uh, in November. Um, there's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. There are joint patrols, you know, and potentially if they become even more aggressive, you know, looking at things like freedom of navigation. So things that are certainly short of, uh, of combat, but ways that the militaries can work together that are, uh, that are somewhat confrontational, but not too far down the path. But there's also terrific non-military ways that the Quad can improve its, uh, its interoperability. You know, for instance, India has banned a number of Chinese apps and the United States has done, is looking to do the same. Doing these things together rather than a bunch of countries all doing it unilaterally and doing it under a set of principles that democracies and like-minded countries think about, you know, is going to be very important. Um, technology areas like 5G, uh, foreign direct investment principles, you know, ensuring that uh, critical industries uh, don't get bought out by China that could give them access to technologies that can improve their, their military industrial base. Uh, regional security, uh, or sorry, regional infrastructure. So there's a lot of very important, I think, non-military things too that the Quad can look at. Um, you know, it was mentioned by a couple of panelists about CATSA, the Counter-American Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. This is the single most important, uh, significant factor that we're going to look at in U.S.-India relations in 2021. That's the year that India expected to take deliverance of the, uh, the first of these S-400 Triumph missile defense systems from Russia. And the United States, there is a narrow pathway to offer a waiver uh, on these sanctions. It was widened somewhat, you know, uh, particularly to, to try to accommodate India. But, uh, you know, even when you look at the pathway through the waiver that exists right now, there's a lot of contention about whether it's wide enough to give India a pass, even if the administration wants to. Um, and so, you know, most likely there's, there's a pretty high chance that you may need to go back and amend it further to make sure that, uh, you know, India won't be sanctioned by this, but will there be the political momentum to do so? So uh, one critical thing to watch in this space that uh, could really change the, uh, uh, the future of U.S.-India relations for the worst if things go sour. But uh, certainly I hope they don't because the future is bright if we can avoid uh, uh, hitting each other uh, involuntarily some of these actions. But thanks again for having me. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Uh, Professor Nalapat, closing remarks. Well, you know, uh, I'd like to say that Turkey seems to have caught a free pass on S-400 and Turkey has gone has now de deployed the S-400. India has not even received the S-400. Frankly, if sanctions were levied on Turkey, then I think that that, that would have been uh, you know, understood in Delhi a lot better 
But the fact that this has not happened has in fact been quite a signal about uh, exactly how, how sincere, if I may say so, elements of the United States administration and Congress are. And you'll remember the Senate leader, Mitch McConnell, has come has blocked any talk of sanctions on Turkey when the House of Representatives overwhelmingly voted for those sanctions. Having said that, I'd like to say that, look, India has been considered non-aligned or aligned with the Soviet Union. You know, in a situation where companies are decoupling from China across the world, they're decoupling from China because the US-China rivalry is real. They, they're not going to be in a hurry to come to a country which is quote unquote neutral or ambivalent. They'd like to come to a country that is clearly uh, standing alongside the United States. And I think with the signing of these agreements, India has signaled that that is the case. So having that, that's why I'm saying, and second point I'd like to say, I mean, 15 years ago, there would have been crowds on the streets protesting these agreements being signed. Uh, five years ago, there would have at least been a lot of op-eds protesting about these agreements being signed. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of op-eds, but I'm seeing very few op-eds except for from my old friends in the communist parties that are in any way critical. So the reality is the Indians now accept that we need the Americans. And I think the Americans also increasingly accept that we need the, the Indians. But I'd just like to say, you know, I have great respect for uh, Mr. Rosso. He is a, he's a tremendous scholar. He's done amazing work in policy. But I'd just like to say that, frankly, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell has set a very poor example, and President Trump, a very poor example of the seriousness of American intent by basically giving a gentleman like Erdogan, who is as much a troublemaker as the Pakistan military, as much a troublemaker as any of the troubles that you'll have from the mullahs in Iran, a free pass on the S-400 system. So I think there is something the Americans also need to do to set their house in order, taking on from what Mr. Sri Ayer was saying. And once again, since you've mentioned Mr. Sri Ayer, we'll go to you next for your closing remarks, Mr. Ayer. Thank you. And it was wonderful to be part of this discussion. Um, not everything is uh, a challenge for India. I believe that Pr Prime Minister Modi is very, very focused on taking India to be a $5 trillion economy. And to this end, he has already done two things. First, he made it possible for uh, companies to easily declare bankruptcy in India. Second, he has given a 15% corporate taxation rate for those companies who are desirous of setting new technological ventures in India. 15% is a great deal for American companies. However, I'd like to have him do two more small things. And with that, I can see that India can easily hit the $5 trillion mark. Number one, it's, and it's very easy to do. Peg the US to rupee relationship at a certain number and say that for four years, this will stay the same. It could be 72. I'm fine with that. Just peg it at that point because that helps a lot of the bigger companies who are going to bring in massive investments to plan their investments better. And secondly, you allow those companies who are setting up shop now in India to repatriate their profits at that same rate. See, this is all possible only when everybody knows this is the amount that's going to come in. This is the amount that's going to go out. It is fine because I can tell you corporate taxation in America today is 20%. When, when India offers 15% and where is US going to go? Uh, Ireland, Ireland is at 12%, 15% to 12%. I don't see much of a difference. As an American entrepreneur, I'd love to see this happen. And if that happens, I can tell you the gateways will open. You don't need to do a lot of stuff. I'm hoping that uh, people who are listening to this uh, conversation in the PMO office, take cognizance of this and make these two simple adjustments and watch India's economy gallop. And along with that, America also will prosper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Iyer, and last but not least, Ambassador Vora. But before I ask for your closing statement, I just want to really quickly mention a couple of questions that came in and specifically for you, Ambassador Vora, um, coming from Mr. Arun Vermani, uh, who is an architect. Uh, they wanted to ask Ambassador Vora if you can recall a dispute using your voice for an iconic program back in February of 1974. Ambassador Vora, can you jog your memory and uh, recall 
settle uh, this dispute um, if, if something took place? In 1974. Gee. Well, at my age, <laughs> I was then I was then at the top of my television career as India's best known television personality, but that was a million years ago. Now, I don't recall what the dispute was. Maybe they threw me out of Doordarshan. I don't remember what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly was on television. Um, Ma'am, I just wanted to say, to, if, if I may, Please. that uh, the Quad was, was created by an act of God. When the tsunami came in 2004, the Indian Navy got active in disaster relief in India and in Indonesia and Sri Lanka, Maldives, etc. And then the other navies joined in. And it has been cemented by an act of a godless country. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, in India, the perception today is very, very clear that what I in the Foreign Service and many of my colleagues used to laugh at about the United States, that is no longer the case. We used to laugh at your, your fondness for what we call checklist diplomacy. Today, fix this guy, tomorrow, deal with that fellow, day after, impose sanction on that chair. Now, I believe that there is a greater perception across the world, and particularly in the United States, of our preferences. So we don't believe in total black nor shimmering white there are shades of gray in the Indian perception. That is how we are going to deal with the rest of the world, sir. Thank you so much, Ambassador Vora, and of course, the rest of the panelists. We are wrapping up here, though I want to stay and talk with you guys. Um, so I'm gonna invite the Vice Chair of the IAPC, uh, Dr. Matthew Joyce, to give the concluding remarks. Dr. Joyce. Uh, namaskar. Namaste to all our prominent panelists and participants. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, indeed. It was a great focused virtual webinar on a highly important and latest topic on which international media and journalists are keenly observing for the last few days. We at Indo-American Press Club are proud to boast that our press club is the first media organization to discuss on the same topic at USA in a short hang with distinguished diplomats and top defense experts. Thank you all, esteemed panelists and participants for making our first of this web series on the topic on the impact of Indo-US defense collaboration agreements signed by both the countries during this week. I never imagined that diplomats and top defense personnel can be sometimes very humorous. You all made this webinar very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the NDR IAPC Board of Directors, National Executive Committee, and chapter members, may I thank you all. We are delighted to have two top-notch defense experts who are, I think, three star studded dignitaries for the first time in our eight years of successful exodus. Lieutenant General Vijay Spanu, we are honored to have your vibrant participation in our first web series on a strategically important topic like this. Thank you. Secondly, respected Vice Admiral Shagar Sinha, may I bestow our profound thanks for your mighty presence as a panelist in our today's virtual webinar. A close associate and well-wisher of IAPC, Honorable Ambassador Pradeep Kumar Kapoor, Thank you so much for escalating the importance of the topic and educating us with your valuable diplomatic experiences. Honorable Ambassador Deepak Oraji, thank you so much for your valuable presence and additional comments and making this event so lively and informative. Thank, thank you, you Professor. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Professor Madhu Nalapak, Vice Chairman of Manipal, Manipal University, being an active panelist and sharing important views on the topic in strong words. We are honored with the participation of Mr. Richard Rosso, Senior Advisor of US-India Policy Studies, GSIS. Thank you, Mr. Raik Rosso. Mr. Sri Ayer, Figuro's Editor-in-Chief, we owe you a big salute and thanks for your participation as a panelist. Finally, cheers to Ms. Ashmita Yogira, Director of Just Marketing Corporation, renowned TV host, and our new IAPC member. A big round of applause and thanks to you for introducing and hosting our virtual webinar meticulously well for today. 
Special thanks to our powerful chairman, Mr. Jo, and Dr. Joseph Chali, National President Dr. S.S. Lal, Founder Chairman Jinsmon Sakaria, Board Secretary Matukuti Iso, General Secretary Biju Chako, our National Executive, National Executive Vice President Annie Jakoshi, and our IT and Zoom team, and all others for making this event happen within this week time itself. We are, we'll be coming up with more similar Zoom webinars with topics of general interest on national, international, and media importance, and look forward for your participation and support in the future too. Our events will be broadcasted on various TV channels and other media. The links will be provided to you shortly and also available on our website at indoamericanpressclub.com. Once again, thank you all and best wishes to you all. Our future is going to be bright. Enjoy a good weekend. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Great to be with you. Thank you. I'm leaving now. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us too hungry. Down to Earth Ambassador. <laughs> Army marches on its stomach. So do ambassadors. They function on their stomachs. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Oso. I was Thank you. Very, very happy to, to meet with you virtually. Okay. Thank you all. To interacting. Thank you so much. We'll bye -bye. be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye, bye to all. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. I'm live streaming in the room, right? Okay. So only the team will be available now? Um, um, leave here. Okay. Pradesha, do you wish to have a round off? That's right. Core team to evaluation. I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. Okay, okay. Then I will leave. Okay. Okay, yeah.